Welcome to the Fire and Earth podcast with your hosts, Jason Mefford and Kathy Gruber. Fire and Earth, giving you the keys to unlock your limitless potential. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Fire and Earth podcast. I'm your co-host, Kathy Gruber. And I'm Jason Mefford. And today we have a very interesting, you probably, the title of this probably jumped out at you, but because most of the time when people talk about cancer, it's like, oh, cancer, death. But what if cancer can save your life, right? So we're excited to have Emily Garfield with us today, because um, that's one of the messages that she shares. And so we want to talk about that. So Emily, welcome, welcome, Thank welcome, you. welcome. Um, you know, maybe to, maybe to start off with, just give kind of the little thumbnail uh, of, of how you kind of got to this point and we'll just kind of see where the where okay, the conversation cool. goes. Awesome. Yeah. So um, you know, when I tell people cancer saved my life, um uh some people are like, what? Like, how did cancer save your life? So I'm gonna take you back to uh year 2015, right before I was diagnosed. Um, I was tur- just turned 39 years old. I had just had got the courage to leave a very toxic marriage. And I, it took me about 10 years of living with this unhappiness inside of me, feeling like I was dying. Already I felt dead. Like I didn't feel alive. I was so unhappy. I had three little kids. They were my miracle babies. Um, I had the perfect house in Santa Barbara. Like I had everything like, right. Why would I not be happy? Um, so the lesson I learned, so all of a sudden I finally am this new life and then bam, another turn, right? Now I have fucking cancer again. Not the first time, but I was born with cancer. So I was literally born with a rare childhood cancer called embryonical rhabdomyosarcoma. And it, it is really the story of my life because in that journey, when I was four, my father committed suicide and my parents were obviously, they were told that I, my cancer was inoperable and they closed me up and told my parents. And then right after that, my dad had committed suicide. So I didn't know all this at the time, but later on through the cancer journey, I would learn that my childhood story would make a huge impact in my life and the story that I told myself. So my shadow, I learned about the shadow work and stuff, which I'll go back into later, but basically cancer saved my life because all these years for 40 plus years, I lived in this little four-year-old body. I call her my little inner child who felt like she was unlovable, like she didn't matter. She wasn't good enough. And I really blamed myself for my dad's suicide. And so I hated cancer. It was like the worst thing that could ever have happened to me. I grew up with no friends that had cancer. So for me, it was very shameful. It was like an embarrassing thing. I had this ugly scar. I wanted to be like everybody else. I was a cheerleader, but I was always like covering my stomach up because they wore these short shirts. I hated wearing bikinis. So, I mean, imagine that was my whole entire life. I lived with anxiety. I had, um, I guess I had depression, which I didn't know it was depression because I was functioning, right? I was living, but deep down inside, like I knew I really wasn't happy. And I left my marriage. A month later, I'm diagnosed with stage three C ovarian cancer. And I'm told that my cancer is incurable. So when you hear the word incurable, yes the first thing that goes to your head is I'm going to fucking die. Like why me? The anger shows up. Um, I deserve this. You know, this is my destiny. And, you know, I went down a dark hole. I went down the rabbit hole, like of, oh my gosh, like, how am I going to do this? I have three little kids. I have twins that are nine. I have a 12 year old and my kids are mad at me for leaving their dad. You know, it was just this whole Mm -hmm. shit show is what it was. And it took me about three weeks until after I started my uh, treatments that I had, I was sent to uh, end of life therapy because the cancer I had was, it was extreme. It was an extreme case. 
the surgery was going to be 15 hours. They were going to remove my vagina, my rectum, my colon, my bladder, my rectus abdominis, and that's your six pack muscles, pull them through the vagina and recreate a new vagina. So at the time I was, I brought the guy that I was dating into the hospital um, room with me. And I just thought, I told him like, you can just leave now. And that moment was like the worst day of my life. And I remember my surgeon saying to me, Emily, if anyone can do this, it's you. Mm. She said, 90% of surviving is in your mindset. She's like half the women that come in here, all they do is research on the internet. They're going to die. That's what they focus on, but you're not that person. You're mm -hmm. young. You got three beautiful kids to live for. And not to mention, like I had just come out of the psych ward for a episode of depression because I wanted to kill myself. So here I am now already hating my life, hating myself, doubting myself. And now I'm faced with fucking cancer again. Like, how am I going to do this? Right. That was the journey. Wow. So I have to wait four more weeks until she does another biopsy. So I get a second opinion, which is a, was a lifesaver for me. So she finds out that I do have ovarian cancer. It's a different kind of cancer and I won't need this dramatic surgery, but I still am going to have to have a colon bag. Um, so lesson number one is always get a second opinion always yep. <clears throat> because the first one, like, you know, everyone sees, uh, they, they may not get enough tissue in the biopsy or, you know, it just gave me hope is what it gave me. Like it still was a shitty diagnosis. I'm not going to lie, but at least I like, wasn't going to have to live with that. I mean, I'm a professional movement teacher. I teach Pilates and yoga. Like my body was my job. So I was going to have to figure out fast after my surgery, being a single mom, fighting in a divorce, you know, how that goes like fighting over money. The money was tied up in a house. Like, how am I going to fucking pay my bills right now? Like I'm like, the bills are coming. I'm stressed out, like financially stressed out. And I had to get resilient, right? I had to figure out like, I didn't want to ask for help. I'm not somebody who asked for help, but someone did a GoFundMe thing. And like, I felt like shame around that. Like, oh, I don't want to be that person. Right. But it saved my life. Like I could pay my bills and feed my kids. And then it was just, it slowly started building up around, around like, what can I do to empower myself to keep going every day? Because every day I wake up sucks right now. Like, you know, it's awful. And I'll never forget that day in that end of life therapy session when he said, you know, you do have a choice. You don't have to finish your treatment and you don't have to have that surgery. You can just live the next six to 12 months and, you know, make memories with your kids. And I literally like, it just like went through me and I was like, I'm not fucking ready to die yet. Like I no, this is now I'm going to start living my life. This is the moment where I take back my power and mm -hmm. I decide how this journey is going to go. Even if I die, like, even if I die, why not live your best life today? Because in the end, nobody really knows, yep. right. What's going to happen. You can change that story. And from there, it was like, everything started falling in place for me. Like the lessons started coming. So my first lesson was, um, I went to an energy healer down in San Diego. I was referred to him by a friend. And of course, you know, every cancer patient or survivor deals with anger. And like I said, my, my anger stemmed not from the cancer really, but from my life before, like I was still angry about my childhood cancer and angry about, you know, why my marriage didn't work out and blah, blah, blah. But it's really not about that. So I go down to this energy healer and he puts his hand on my, my stomach. And he said, whoa, Emily, like you are so toxic. Like your body's radiating heat. You're going to probably die of anger before you die of cancer. So that was my first lesson. Like, how do I heal anger? Yeah. Who do I have to forgive? Myself was probably the number one first person I had to forgive. And then it was, you know, I, I found a mentor, like one of my, ally, my ally, allies. And I was like, okay, this one was 
uh, what's your new life story going to look like? So then I started learning about brain and behavior and how our brain is super powerful. Like you can rewire your thoughts. You can change that story. And then it became like a game for me. I read this book called super better. I don't have it right here, but it was all, it's a science-based book. It is all about, you know, people who have post-traumatic growth or post-traumatic stress and how you can turn that around. So you can take cancer or divorce or anything, right? Anything traumatic event uh-huh. and you can turn it around and make your life better after. So you use it as like fuel. What and was the name of the book? It was called super better. Um, God, do I have it right here? Um, it That's was okay. awesome. It was like, so it was, I just started doing little things that would like train my brain or there was another book called you can't ruin my day. Cause everything was like ruining my day. So I was like, okay, like I can either let it ruin my day or I can choose to like find joy in this situation. So I started going to my treatments and chemotherapy and I actually started to enjoy it. Whereas everyone else around me was terrified. They're like, oh my God, cancer. It was like the worst thing. And they were so negative. So I chose to not hang around negative people. I chose mm-hmm. not to join negative support groups. I chose to hire a life coach instead of going to a therapist, which I did for a while. But after a while, I was like living in my same depressing story. And so I knew if I was going to survive this, I wanted to like become a new person. So I wanted to create this new identity. And so I used dancing, I used, you know, writing and all these things to help empower myself. And in the end, I didn't know if I was going to survive, but every year I got that milestone. It was like, I I lived in three months, I think every three months. And once I hit that, you know, your NED or no evidence of disease or cancer free, you know, every year gets easier. The anxiety, I have no more anxiety. I have no more depression. I, I, it's all gone. And I really feel like I've healed myself from the inside out. So that's my story in a nutshell. Wow. <laughs> oh, so many things. Okay. But, so uh, yeah, no, but it's just this, wow. Thank you. And thank you for fighting and being here because you have such an incredible message for people on a very, very random personal note. My mother died from rhabdomyosarcoma. <gasps> no way. Wow. She was one of the few adults that had ever been diagnosed with it because it's a childhood disease. I got the chills. Yep. Yeah. As soon as you, as soon as you said a rare childhood cancer, I thought, oh, I bet I know what you're going to say. Gosh. And that's how my mother passed away. Yeah. Um, and you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, it's just so, I've never met anybody else that had that. I mean, because it, you're not supposed to survive it. Right. So of course right, I wouldn't right, have right. met anybody else that had that. Um, but to talk about the anger, right. So many people hold on to anger, anger about their childhood. My parents were a piece of shit. I had an awful child. Why don't I have more money? He was a jerk. She was an asshole. <laughs> da, 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 da. And they hold on to that anger and you're right. It is so toxic and it fuels all these other emotions of shame and grief. And, you know, so how did you, other than the gentleman in San Diego saying, wow, you've got so much anger. How did you make amends with yourself? And with your ex and with your childhood, and was there a specific thing you did, or was just the recognition enough? Oh or how no, did no, that no! Go? There was there was a lot. There was like, I mean, I had, I feel like seven years on this journey, right? So every year I pick something new, like a new course to take. I'm always yeah. doing something to better myself and learning. Like I love learning. I if I had these tools that I learned now, I probably could have still been married, right? But I didn't know. So you put two people together in a marriage who both had trauma. And, you know, it, it, unless you do the work yourself, like you can't fix someone you, you know, and I realize, you know, I can send my husband compassion today, an ex-husband, although he may not say the same for me, but, but I've done the work, right? So I can see like in him, he has a little child that's sad and, you know, I abandoned him too, like his mother did and he's angry at me, right? I don't blame him, but, um, I personally didn't know all the trauma that I went through. I thought trauma was like, you know, you had to be raped or you had to be like, it was like, my trauma wasn't like that. So I never gave myself permission to say I had trauma because people had it worse than me. Yeah. And then when I was in the psych ward, I was like, I just feel like dying. And, um, you know, my friend shamed me for that. Like that mom that's in the psych ward, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because the, the psychiatrist came in and said, 
this is not the place for you. Like you've never had therapy. Like no one's ever told you, you, this is like trauma. I'm like, no. And so I started going into trauma work and I started taking this course, um, which I teach now it's called the quantum, the art of quantum living process. So it's really about transforming yourself from the inside out, but it really, you have to go back in time as uncomfortable as it is. And you basically like take a scenario or a trigger, right? There are certain triggers in my life that are still there. Very right. So I went through those very, I'm just going to pick five specific times. And so you write down the trigger, the emotions, the feelings, and then you have your shadow or I am statement. I'm not lovable. I'm not worth it. Like I am, I am broken. I am flawed. And then you see that every time somebody triggers you or any situation that there's something inside of you that needs to be more healed. And so I would keep doing this over and over and I still do it today. And then finally you rewrite that trigger with these new qualities that you know are within you. Like I am lovable. I am good enough. And so once you can see that and then you can rewrite, write it, and then you give yourself this authentic action of taking care of yourself over time with practice, you, you start to shift. And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm not that same woman I was seven years ago. I am completely different woman, Mm -hmm. but it does take work, right? There's no magic pill. There's no mad. And everyone wants the magic pill there that you have to do the work. And I look at it as, um, like empowering and like, I I love and showing my kids, like, this is, you're going to make mistakes in life. Like you are like, no one's perfect. Right. But you can choose to get back up on your two feet. You can forgive, you can, you know, apologize, own your story, own what the mistakes and then, and then move on. Right. And if the other person chooses not to forgive you, that's, that's on them, not on you. Like you did your work, right. You can't change other people. Oh boy. If we could, I know. (laughs) Well, one thing that you said, you know, towards the beginning, as you were sharing your story really struck me too, where you said that you already felt dead. Absolutely. Right. And and I think, you know, especially when, when people talk about cancer, it scares the shit out of everybody. Totally. Right? Yeah. I mean, cancer is the big boogeyman, right? <laughs> but what's interesting is, is like you said, you know, if you already felt dead before, right. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting is a lot of times it takes something some situation like a cancer staring physical death in the face to realize that we're already dead, that we're not uh, yes, actually living, right? It, Which was one yeah. of the things that I kind of got gathered from you as you were talking about starting to live really from that point, right? Starting to see things as fun. Right. Yeah, going, so basically going to chemotherapy I, or some yeah. of the other stuff in, in a different way and kind of flipping that around. So how did you, how did you kind of do that? How did you so, reframe it? Uh, well, I reframed it. That's a great question because, you know, one thing was, is I already had allowed my childhood cancer to ruin my life. It was, you know, and I was just done with that story. I wanted to close that chapter and write a new chapter. And like you said, like I already felt powerless. I felt dead. I was like, just walking around, doing things for other people, being a people pleaser, like worried what everyone's thinking about me. And then cancer comes. And I was like, well, what if I just fucking like start fresh? Like, what if I have like a fresh slate? Like, this is like the chemotherapy is going into my body, it's burning all the cancer cells. The old me is gone now. And I looked at it as like a new opportunity. Every time like the drug would come in, like, okay, what are you going to do today, Emily? Just at one day at a time, what's it going to be something? So I journaled, I wrote a carrying bridge and I wrote, um, I had quotes and I just, every day I, I focused on the good thing, even if it was like a flower that bloomed. I mean, it was sim- simple. It wasn't like this big term, like dramatic shift in like one day, right? It was the little things, but you're right. I was already at rock bottom. Like the only way for me to go was either up or dead. Right. So I had two options. Like you're, you're, you're this close to dying. Like you can either give up and surrender. And and I did have moments of that. Trust me when I had my bowel obstruction at the end and they said, you may not be able to have your ileostomy reversed. And I was sitting in the hospital, told my doctor, I said, I can't do this anymore. It was like a, a year. And I'm like, 
I cannot do this. Like I'm ready to go. Like, just Mm -hmm. give me the morphine button and I'm out. Right. And he's like, I know you, you're just having a really bad day. He goes, I want you to get up, walk around the hospital and don't come back until bedtime because you can get in the spiral in your head. Right. And just go down the rabbit hole, all the dark things of all Mm -hmm. the things you hate about your life. Why me? I'm never going to be able to do this. Um, so it, it just, it's a process of, like I said, going into that, um, the story, like the story that we all tell ourselves, we all have a story, Yep. cancer or not, like we all have one. And so what is, you know, Astrid Follick, what is the story you're telling yourself? What would be possible for you on the other side of that story? When, not if, like when you shift that thought, what if, instead of saying, what if I die? Like, what if I live? Right. Why do we never, we're not up in the middle of the night. What if any of the good stuff comes? Yeah. What if I get that raise? And what if he loves me? And what if I get the, you know, what if he I know cancer? Like, and what here's if real- my number one tip. Like, don't wait until like you're cancer free or don't wait until you get cancer. Like to help you be like, start now. Like yeah. I did not wait until I was told I was cancer free. That would have been a long time to start changing my life. I yep. started the moment I got cancer and I would do anything I could to find the people to help me along the journey. You cannot do it alone. It's very difficult. And so when you find other people and mentors and coaches and Mm -hmm. anyone that can help you guide you, that supports you and loves you and doesn't judge you, that's the person you want to be with. You know, a big thing was I had a, I had to set boundaries um, for myself around. um, I lost, I don't even, I have a couple of friends from before, but I have a whole new group of friends right? And most of them are all professional, like life coaches and stuff and, and new cancer survivors. But you know, that's part of the journey is like, maybe you're hanging around with people that are, aren't like, you know, supporting you and believing in you. Like for me, like I didn't believe in myself. So if I'm hanging out with someone who's not going to like encourage me to grow. Like that person's not in my inner circle anymore. Yeah. Yeah. We've talked about the whole support system and inner circle. And I mean, we've cut so much of what you're talking about has been like so many of our past episodes. Oh, so, good. so well, so we're, we're, as we, as Capricorn needs to chime in. So we're starting to run out of time. Um, so you do coaching now too, right? You help right. others that are, who is your, who, what clients find you? So obviously like my can't, my Instagram is cancer save my life. So I, I attract uh, cancer survivors, but interesting. I, more of my clients are not cancer survivors. They're like the clients of the cancer patient or their husband or wife passed away from cancer. Mm-hmm. Most of them, a lot of them are, they come from my studio. I'm a movement professional. Um, and so, you know, I connect movement, the whole mind body connection, like energy work. And, and, and so I'm like, Hey, like, you know, you might benefit from this. And they are like shocked because I don't go out and you know, advertise what I do when I'm in my studio. Right. But it's, it's a part of who I am and it changed yeah. me. So if I can help anyone, but yes, clearly, um, you know, cancer is my niche, right. It's my, <laughs> it's my, my, my passion. And, um, I just want to find that woman who wants to better herself because not everyone does a lot of yep. people want to live in the victim story, which they they're not ready. You have to be ready for the work. Yeah. Those are the people that I work with. Well, and it's interesting you said it because I'm a life coach as well. And I have had people show up to my office and they want to complain for an hour about their neighbor's boyfriend's cousin's dog's husband. And I'm like, I'm not coaching them. Yeah, like, I know. And they think it's just a bitch session for an yeah. hour. I'm like, look, if you want a bitch, call a girlfriend and get coffee. Totally. I'm not going to take your time. I'm not going to waste my time or your time. <laughs> I, I don't need your money that bad that I want to exactly. listen to you bitch about something for an hour because yeah. that's not what coaching is. No, that's yeah. It's all about moving relationship forward. Is. Yeah. It's like, where are you now? And, and you do the work. You yeah. Yeah. It's not my job to tell you what to do. Well, can't you just tell me what to do? I can, but that's not coaching. <laughs> exactly. That's, Cap- that's Capricorn taking over. All right. Oh my God. Jason, any final <laughs> thoughts from you before we send all oh, no. the No, Emily, thank you. Thank you for coming on because again, I think, you know, I, I know it's a shorter episode. So people go, go back and listen to this again, because Emily dropped a bunch of bombs when she was talking and, you know, for those of you that have been listening to us for a while, we, we try to throw out, you know, little practices and things that you can do all the time. Emily is the embodiment of like taking most of the things we've been talking about and doing almost all of them. That's the key word, embody. You have to embody it. You have to embody it. it. Yeah. Yep. And feel it. And, and once you feel it and you start seeing it change, you're going to do it more. Yep. 
Yeah. And, 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 you know, there's, there's really no reason for us to wait never until something big happens, a divorce, cancer, whatever else, right? Most people wait, they're dead most of their life. They wait for some big traumatic event or experience to happen before it kicks them in the ass and then they actually want to start doing stuff, right? How much better would our life be if we started living now? In, oh, what a, before instead, you get off, you know? before you get off, I just want to say really quickly that I was so worried about what my kids would happen to my kids and what they would think about their mom. And you know, I had this mom guilt. My mm. kids today now are like, um, they're so happy. They're so happy for me. They're way better off. They're like, you know, because we're not in a toxic yelling marriage, right? So. <laughs> Mm -hmm. it's 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 changed you know it's just so if you're afraid of that like kids are resilient like kids will bounce back and you just love them tell them be honest with them and that's really what I do with my kids so yeah 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 no I agree with you oh this has been so great Emily tell people where they can reach you I know you're on Instagram okay, Facebook I'm on Instagram website at cancer saved my life and my website is my name Emily Garfield it's e-m-i-l-e-e -E. Garfield like the cat.com Yay! Cool. This Garfield we'll have, and Odie. Ooh, yeah. Do you remember those oh, little cartoons? Cartoon. I love that cartoon. Um, so I'm, I'm so glad you. I'm not fat. I'm fluffy. Well, thank you for um reaching out. I feel honored. I I, I love talking. So anytime you want to talk, just uh, yeah. Yay! Well, we're happy you're on. Thank you for for sharing your story and for doing the work because you know you le are leading by example. So Aww, thank Kathy you, Kathy Gruber. You're welcome. I can be reached at kathygruber.com. And I'm Jason Mefford. I can be reached at jasonmefford.com. So go out, have a great week. Start incorporating some of these things that Emily's been talking about because you can see the smile on her face and you can get an idea of what her life was like before and what it is like now by doing the work. So let's just start doing the work and we'll see you in the next episode. See ya. See ya. Bye.